Yeah, so my name is uh, Alex Strong. I work with Matt at Square. So I'm also from Kitchener Waterloo and I work on Square Cache doing Android stuff. Um, today I'm going to be talking about understanding IntelliJ plugins. So I think I already know the answer to this question because uh, a lot of you are Android developers, but how many people are actually using some variation of IntelliJ? So like Android Studio, IntelliJ. Okay, so pretty much everyone, that's good. So th this will be pretty relevant. Um, even if you're not someone who's developing tools, just understanding how Android Studio is working and some of those tools I think is really valuable um, because Android Studio at its core is just a IntelliJ plugin. That's how it started and then they eventually forked into their own build so that they could add sort of unique features to it. So things like the design preview, right, for XML, that's sort of implemented as an IntelliJ plugin. And actually, if you're interested in how it works, because it's all open source, you can go look and see how it was implemented. So if you yourself want to build uh, an IntelliJ plugin that's sort of similar to the design preview, then you can look at the, the code that they wrote. Um, so before I go into this, what I want to do is sort of talk about tools in general, because I feel like they're sort of a neglected part of the open source community. Um, oftentimes when you think of Android, you think of sort of the libraries like Dagger, Butterknife, Retrofit, um, those kind of things that you're going to be using. You don't really think about the tools behind it. And there's a lot of different types of tools. Uh, I've listed a bunch of your IDE build tools like Gradle, debug or even debugging tools like Logcat, or uh, if you're in Android, you can just like turn on certain developer tools from there as well. They'll help you do debugging. Interfaces, web tools, so things like uh, version control or even GitHub that you're doing to use code review. These are all examples of tools. And without them, our lives would be a lot more difficult. It would be really hard to debug things. It would be really hard to sort of work as a developer. So I think that building tools, understanding how they work, and knowing when to build a tool is actually a really useful skill. So I hope that what this presentation can do for you is sort of teach you to see the patterns of where a tool might come in handy and understand how you yourself could actually build one. And specifically, I'm going to be talking about IntelliJ plugins. So it's really just that IDE point that I'm talking about. But these other ones are sort of, they're implemented in very similar ways, especially something like build tools. A lot of these skills that I'm going to be teaching you about are very applicable to build tools. Something like Lint actually uses the same model that IntelliJ uses. Uh, it's called PSI. I'll go a little bit more into that later. But uh, so the skills that you sort of learn through this, you could actually use to build custom lint rules if you wanted to. So there's a, there's a lot of like cross pollination going on here. Things that you learn very you probably put into some of these other things. Um, so the first thing that I want to get into is why you should build a tool, when you should build a tool. I think so. Libraries are, are often talked about, and it's kind of obvious when you want to build a library. There's you sort of see this problem, and you can sense that there's a way that you could abstract out a solution, and then open source it, give it to the community, and now everyone else can sort of solve the same problem with this one library. Um, but tools are, are sort of different. Uh, my experience with tools is I work on a plugin, IntelliJ plugin called SQL Delight, and that arose because I found that writing SQL Delight in Android was very confusing. You're typically doing it just in a string. Uh, and it's hard to read, it's hard to maintain, and so what I wanted to do was sort of abstract it into something else. And what SQL Delight does is it lets you write SQLite queries in a separate file, and then it gives you all of these IDE language level features like autocomplete and checking to make sure that actually like columns and tables exist that you're querying from. So really, the reason that you start to build a tool, it sort of arises from confusion. It's like you as a developer are doing something within your code base, and it just doesn't quite make sense, and it's not in a way that you can abstract out a layer of code. It's just in a way where you don't understand what's going on. Um, something like RxJava, if you've ever used this, a lot of the time I find myself very confused by things that are going on in RxJava. It makes these asynchronous calls very easy to do, but sometimes it's not always clear what thread things are actually running on in RxJava. So you can imagine an IntelliJ plugin that gives you sort of visual indicators that tell you which thread something is running on. Uh, something like Dagger, dependency injection. You have this object graph that's sort of throwing objects into classes, um, and it's done behind the scenes, so you don't actually know where the object is coming from. But you could build an IntelliJ plugin that shows you where they're coming from. Say you click on the actual inject call, and then it brings you to the provide source. It sort of tells you where that object is coming from. Um, so these, these sort of things exist all over the place, uh, and I think that once you sort of pick up the pattern of like you're confused by something and you understand how IntelliJ works, which is hopefully what I'll teach you by the end of this, then you can sort of see how you could build your own plugin um, to fix some of these problems. So what I'm going to go into is actually how IntelliJ functions behind the scenes. Um, because once you understand this, it's actually it's the exact same. How IntelliJ is running is also how you're building a plugin. Uh, IntelliJ uses its own APIs. 
So talking about how IntelliJ is like viewing the file and how it's operating on it is the same as talking about how to actually build your own plugin. And really where it all starts is with a Java I.O. file. This is gonna be like the first thing that IntelliJ opens up. Um, what it does almost immediately after that is it turns it into its own internal representation of a file, which is a virtual file. And the reason it has this is that there's certain file callbacks that you might want to get from a I.O. file that it doesn't give you right off the bat. So things like refactoring or when a file moves, if someone's like dragging a file and putting it somewhere else, an I.O. file isn't going to tell you when that happens, but a virtual file can. Um, so IntelliJ does this for you, but if you wanted to do it on your own, you could take a I.O. file and then use this local file system instance to get the virtual file for that. So as I was saying, it's, uh, it's IntelliJ's representation of a file. There's one for every file. Um, it gives you all these sort of lifecycle callbacks. One of the important ones is actually this uh, is valid. So when a file gets deleted on the system, you won't be able to interact with it anymore, and that reference doesn't exist. But a virtual file persists as long as IntelliJ is open. And so you actually need to check to make sure that a virtual file is valid, that is, like it hasn't been deleted yet, before you start doing uh, operations on it. And then there's these two auxiliary craft classes, virtual file manager and virtual file listener, which sort of give you those callbacks I was talking about, um, like refactoring renaming those kind of things. So then there's this, there's this level below that. If virtual file is giving you the file level changes in IntelliJ, a document is going to be giving you the actual text level changes. So to get a document, you can do it one of two ways. You can do this get, get cache document or get document. Uh, and the reason these two APIs exist is that documents are cached. They're weakly referenced by a virtual file. So if you call get cache document and the document isn't actually open, like it hasn't been opened in IntelliJ, then it's just going to return null. But if you call get document, then it will open it for you, not necessarily in the UI, but just like in memory, and then you're guaranteed to actually get a reference back. Um, so that's the important thing with documents. You need to remember that they're weakly referenced, they're loaded in memory. Um, but the, the difference really between this document and the virtual file is that the document is the text level changes. When you're like actually making changes to a file, you're making changes to the document. Where you're making changes to like the file name or its placement, you're making changes to the virtual file. So that's sort of why this distinction exists, and the document is going to be like a lot bigger uh, just because of how much is going on in it. So the editor, that's like IntelliJ, the actual UI, it's going to hold a reference to the document. Uh, and sometimes while you're creating a plugin or in IntelliJ, you will have a reference to the editor, or you can get a reference to an editor. Um, and so from an editor, you can get the currently open document or like all the open documents, that kind of thing. And then similar to the virtual file, you also have this interface document listener if you want to get more document level changes. Um, something I find really useful is like you can get uh, sort of a callback whenever the document has synchronized. Um, and that's a really important level. Uh, so you can go back from a document to a virtual file. There's, there's these two IntelliJ level sides to it, the virtual file and the document, and then there's the Java I.O. file side to it. Um, and when I was talking about the document being synchronized, what I mean is that when you're making changes to a document, it's not actually making changes to the I.O. file. IntelliJ has like its own internal mechanisms for synchronizing that document back to disk. And what that means is that even though you can change an I.O. file, a virtual file, and a document, you should never be changing the I.O. file. If you want to change the file name, you should do it through virtual file. And if you want to change the file text, you should be doing it through the document. Because any changes you do on disk will have conflicts with the changes that are happening in memory. And you may have actually seen this in Android Studio through a UI that's like, hey, we noticed that there are changes in memory as well as on disk. Which one do you want to keep? And as a plugin developer, you never want to sort of promote that UI. You always want to make sure that you're doing things in memory so that the user isn't going to get like confusing interfaces brought up for them. Uh, so this is the file level of things. If all you're doing is working with files, then this is going to be enough. But typically what you're doing and what makes IntelliJ really powerful is actually the language level. And this is sort of when it comes to a uh, almost like a compiler-like way of thinking about things. Um, and there's two different parts to it. The first part is the AST node. And what an AST node is, it represents a single part of the tree of your actual language. So AST stands for uh, Abstract Syntax Tree. And if you're familiar with compilers, this is, it represents pretty much any node, such as like a field or a method or a class. Those types of things are all going to be separate nodes in the tree, and you can traverse that node and get to different parts of it. Even something like a semicolon is going to be represented in an AST. It's going to be a terminal node. Um, so with the AST node, you can do all this traversal at runtime. You can learn more about the actual file that they have open. 
Um, but because it's done at runtime, you can get into these like runtime exceptions. You, you're going to have to do the casting at runtime as well. So say if you had a class and you wanted to find all of the methods, then you would have to look over its children, see if they're an instance of method, and then uh, do all your logic on that. So that's one level. The, the other side is PSI, which I brought up before. It stands for Program Structure Interface. Um, you can get to it from three different ways. If you're going from a virtual file and you want to get to a PSI file, you can use this PSI manager. If you're going from a document and you want to get to a PSI file, then you can use, similar to how documents were cached, PSI files are also cached, so you can use like these get cached documents to go from PSI file to document, or get PSI file, and then there's also a get cached PSI file. Um, there's a lot of different things going on here. You can also go from the AST node to a PSI file just by calling get PSI. And like I said, because all the casting is being done at runtime, you have to pass the actual type of PSI to it. Uh, one thing you'll notice is here I'm using Kotlin syntax. For the rest of this presentation, I'll be using Kotlin syntax. If you're not familiar with the language, it's very similar to Java. If you can read Java, you can likely read Kotlin. And I'll point out any differences uh, just to make sure that they're clear. This one, for example, this is the same as just saying PSI field .class. So when you call get PSI, it's actually going to return to you a PSI field um, instead of the other one, which is the generic PSI element, which is like a super type of all different PSI. So PSI, it stands for Program Structure Interface. Um, and it does a very similar thing to AST. So they map one to one. Every AST node is going to have a PSI element. And so you might be wondering, like, why do these two things exist? And the answer is that the PSI elements, where AST is sort of giving you these language level, com almost compiler-like things, what PSI is doing is it's giving you contextual level stuff. So a PSI element could be an instance of a PSI reference, and if that's the case, then you can do things like call resolve on it. And so say if you had a PSI method and you called resolve on it, it would actually link to the PSI element, which is where that method was declared. Similarly, you could do the same for fields, you could do the same for classes, what this means is that a bunch of intelligent features like autocomplete and refactoring are sort of given to you. If you're creating a PSI element and it implements PSI reference and it points to some other element, if that element gets renamed, uh, then your element is also going to get renamed. Likewise, if you like command click on an element, all it's doing is it's calling resolve on that PSI element and bringing you to the source. So yeah, these map one to one with AST nodes. Um, this is like this is the big architecture, the, the PSI stuff, and it's what I'm going to be talking about most of this presentation. Um, and it's the thing that's going to be powering like Lint in the future. And if you're writing an intelligent plugin, it's like mostly what you're going to be working with. Um, so I talked about how the top level was being created. It's it's coming from this I/O file, but I haven't talked about how this language level is being created. Um, they're being created through this class called a parser definition. Um, and what a parser definition is, it, is, it provides these two things, a lexer and a parser, which are going to take a parse sequence and just turn it into these elements. Now, if you're writing a plugin, you pretty much never need to deal with this, because unless you're writing a language level plugin or implementing your own language, then you don't need to write a parser definition. But what is interesting is that IntelliJ, by default, has the Java parser definition as well as the XML parser definition. What this means is that if your IntelliJ plugin is working with Java PSI elements, then you have those for free. You don't have to worry about like implementing a Java parser. Likewise, you can depend on other plugins. You can depend on like the Go plugin. And then now you get all of the PSI Go elements, so you can perform operations on those as well. Um, so yeah, you don't have to worry about providing these yourself unless you're writing a, an actual language plugin. Um, but besides that, you don't need to worry about the parser definition. So the, the, the important thing about AST nodes versus PSI elements is that if you're doing any sort of language level stuff, something like auto formatting, for example, then that's going to happen on the AST nodes because there's no actual like contextual stuff that you have to deal with. But if you are doing the contextual actions such as resolving or autocomplete, um, then you're going to be doing stuff with the PSI elements. Oh, I just went back to the start of this. Okay. Yeah, there's a, it's, it's a lot to think about. I'll, I'll be going over some code examples and it'll, like, it'll become a little bit clearer how these all fit together. Um, but typically, yeah, you're just going to be working on PSI elements if you're writing an IntelliJ plugin. And if you like, are looking through source code of IntelliJ or Android Studio, then you're going to see a lot of these around um, sort of dealing with PSI elements, navigating through PSI elements to learn more about the, the actual plugin. 
Uh, so that's one side of it. That's like your file and how a file is being parsed by IntelliJ and turned into its own architecture. There's another level, which is IntelliJ itself. So like the thing that shows up in your doc uh, sort of represents itself in a few different internal models. The first one is the application. This is like the most top level. If you think about IntelliJ in the doc, um, like this is how it's being represented. And the application, you can get a reference to it through this application manager .get application. Uh, there's only ever one, so that makes sense because there's only ever one instance of IntelliJ Open. Um, it manages things like concurrency. This one is really important because when you're making changes to the document or the virtual file, they need to be like concurrent, they need to be managed. And so you use these two APIs, run read action and run write action. And when you do that, you actually you get a lot of stuff for free. This is one of the one of the times where like IntelliJ's power really shines is that if you put your so your document changes inside of a run write action, then you'll automatically get things like undo for free. Once you commit that write action, then that is seen in, by IntelliJ as like a full write action. And then if they undo, it will undo the full write action. Um, and so this is really handy if you're doing really complex like sort of modifications on a virtual file or a document. Um, then as long as you put it inside of a run write action, you're just going to get all that stuff for free. It also contains a bunch of state. Uh, pretty much all of these things are going to contain a bunch of state that are dealing with like the application level, project level, all those things. Uh, this is useful for like debugging if you want to know if you're in an early access preview or like how long the IntelliJ instance has been running for. And then uh, you can get information about your current thread. So like similar to the run read, run read action, run write action, you can tell if the thread you're on is on a read or a write thread. So the next level down is a project. And again, this maps one-to-one -one with sort of what you see in the IntelliJ, IntelliJ UI. So project is going to be like one of the windows that you have open inside of IntelliJ. You might have many multiple windows open. Um, there are managers that are per project. A lot of the code that you'll see I'm using is like this project manager or application manager. A lot of the time what you're doing is passing in a project to those managers because the code that you want to write or you want to run is only for that project. So you can get an instance of a project really easily from like a PSI element, for example, by just calling get project. But most often what you're going to be doing is just passing a project to these APIs just to tell IntelliJ what project you're operating on. Uh, the level down from that is a module. So again, this maps one-to-one -one in the UI. If you have one window open, then there might be many modules. And again, in IntelliJ, similar thing. Uh, so you can get all the modules for a project by using an API just like I was talking about where you pass a project in and you ask for the modules back. Uh, modules, you don't really do much with. The one thing that they're interesting for is uh, performing searches. So oftentimes, if you're writing an IntelliJ plugin and you care about sort of only looking over unit tests, for example, you want your code to only run, run over unit tests, then that's something the module is going to know about. So then you're going to pass a module into some manager and then run code just for unit tests. And then the file below that is the virtual files which I was talking about before, but you can actually, you can do these sort of file index operations to go over all of the virtual files per project or per module. So if you're writing a plugin and you want to just like perform operations on every single virtual file or check for something, uh, that's how you would do it. So this is the architecture, all of these things I've talked about, application project module, virtual file document, PSI elements. Uh, that's the architecture behind IntelliJ plugins. Um, that's one part of it. And actually, if you're just like thinking about your code, those are enough to sort of understand how IntelliJ is thinking about them. But once you start writing a plugin, you need to sort of have an access point into your plugin. And the first one that you can have is something called a component. Um, and these map one to one with those state, stateful things I was talking about in the last slide. So you have application components, project components, and module components. And what they do is they give you lifecycle callbacks for each of those uh, different stateful things. So you get lifecycle callbacks for application project and module. It'll tell you like when they've been opened, closed, uh, similar for module, like it'll give you lower level context because you can close a module without the project being closed. And so what you can do with these is if you have something that you want to say like run at initialization, then you can add an application component and then it will give you a callback for when the application has been opened and then you can run initialization code in there. Uh, so to declare these, you have this XML file. It's uh, similar to an Android manif manifest, actually. You just have one. It's called plugin XML. And in it, you just declare a list of things that sort of tell IntelliJ uh, how to work with your plugin. So application components, project components, and module components are all going to live here. There's a bunch of other stuff that you can list in your uh, configuration file. 
things like the name of the plugin, uh, what builds it supports. When I was talking about how you could like depend on the Go plugin, this is also how you would do that. Here I'm saying I depend on the Android plugin. Uh, and by having this, what that means is that Android Studio is supported because the Android plugin is essentially Android Studio. Um, so yeah, you can sort of declare all of these things in your configuration file. Uh, in addition to components, there's also another piece called extension points. So where components are giving you those lifecycle callbacks, extension points are more specific uh, utility that you're sort of providing to IntelliJ. If you think about Java, like you can register with thread, with the current thread, you can say like thread dot, uh, register uncaught exception handler. This is sort of similar where you're just sort of registering these services that are gonna run in specific situations. So go to declaration handler, if you, uh, if you register one of these, then this is gonna call every time someone can clicks on something. It's gonna ask your go to declaration handler, like can you handle this and where do you want me to go to? Post startup activity is going to give you a callback when all of the initialization stuff is already finished. It's like indexing, those kind of things. Uh, error handler is going to give you a callback whenever a exception occurs in your plugin. So you could send your exception to Bugsnag or another error reporting thing if you're, a if you're a plugin developer and you care about that. And then completion contributor is just going to run whenever they do the control spacebar and start like auto-completing what they're currently typing. And there's a whole list of these. Uh, it's, it's sometimes difficult to figure out which one you want. And what I would recommend doing is looking at other people's plugin XML files as like a starting point. So because a lot of these plugins are open source, something like the Kotlin plugin or the Android plugin, you can look at their plugin XML files uh, and just learn a, bit, a lot about how the plugin is actually operating. You can find sort of what extension points they're creating, what components they're creating, uh, as well as like what actions they're creating, which I'll talk about. And they uh, and by using that as a starting point, you can see how they actually implement things like the design preview or Android's go-to declaration handlers, those kind of things. Um, actions is the third piece. These are the simplest of them. It's just when the user does something, then it's gonna call into your class. Um, so in this case, like I've just created something that's gonna be a shortcut. You just say control B, and then it's gonna call into your class, com sample my action. Uh, and there's some callbacks in there that you're gonna get. So uh, a lot of these things you sort of come across organically, like most of the stuff that I've talked about, I, I've come across organically. The IntelliJ documentation isn't incredibly thorough. For some things it is, but because the APIs are like so wide, it's impossible to like document all of them. So I've included this slide as like a, if you're interested in writing plugins, these are sort of how I have learned about writing IntelliJ plugins. Uh, and if you wanted to do it yourself, this is like what I would recommend. The big one is the, the JetBrains community forum, going straight to the source and like asking the JetBrains people is actually really responsive. They're, they typically have a fast turnaround for answering your questions. And a lot of the like lead developers will come in and help you out. Uh, AOSP is great, that's the Android open source project. So you can look at the open source Android implementations uh, and learn a lot about how IntelliJ plugins work. Open source stuff is great. Um, there's just so many projects already existing on GitHub that are excellent IntelliJ plugins. I, I find for something like testing, for example, testing isn't super well supported for IntelliJ plugins, but all of the major ones, Kotlin, Go, Rust, they have really good testing support. So if you cared about testing your IntelliJ plugin, I would look to them as like the example of how to do it properly. Okay, so uh, I've talked about a lot of things, a lot of like architectural stuff and how IntelliJ functions, but what I want to do is sort of give an example of how to actually write a plugin, a simple plugin, to show just like how easy it actually is, uh, despite there being so much going on. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring it together, and I'm actually going to I'm going to go back to one of the examples that I was pointing out as something that's confusing, which is Dagger. Um, if you're not familiar with how Dagger works, it's for dependency injection. There is essentially this object graph that you're declaring through these modules. And then you have these classes that are asking for objects from the object graph. So in this case, I'm asking for an instance of some class, and then this module is providing the instance of some class. Um, so this is just like a pattern in computer science. It's, it's really handy. But if you're writing these classes that are accepting objects, it's not always obvious where these classes are coming from. So what I want to do is I want to write a plugin where if you are focused on that field, you can perform some action and it will bring you to the source. Um, so that way you can tell where your objects are actually coming from. So the first thing that we need to do is declare an action in our configuration file. So in this case, I'm just calling it go to provider and I'm giving it the keystroke control B. So if you press control B while you're focused on an inject field, then it's gonna bring you to the actual provider. 
So what you need to do is actually implement that action. Uh, the interface that you have to implement is called an action, and I'm just calling my go-to provider action. Uh, if you implement this, then you need to override two functions. There's one action performed, and there's one update. Um, update is gonna get called first. It's the one that sort of says, will this action run in this scenario? And then if you say, like, yes, this will run in this scenario, then it will call action performed, and you can do all your logic there. So update runs first, then action performed is gonna run, and that's action performed is actually what's going to navigate to the provider. Uh, so let's implement update first. So we need to get a bunch of information from this action event because we need to like know, okay, is this an injected field? Is this a field at all? Those kind of things. So the first thing we're gonna do is say, don't run this action. And the reason I'm doing this is that I essentially just want to check a bunch of things and then at the end I will say, yes, do run this action. But if any one of those fails, I want it to not run. So I'm just gonna say ahead of time, like don't run this action. Uh, the first thing that I want to get out of this update is a PSI file. So the way that you get information from an action is through this get data API, and there's an interface called data keys, which just has a bunch of things in it that you can grab from any arbitrary action. Um, this question mark colon at the end is called the Elvis operator, if you're not familiar with it. So what it does is if get data returns null, then it will just perform whatever is to the right of the Elvis operator. So in this, in this case, if the PSI file that I want from the action is null, then it's just gonna return. So this is why I said that the action shouldn't run in the first line, is because I'm just gonna return immediately if there's no PSI file. Uh, and you, sort of, you just wanna follow this pattern so that you know that none of your objects are null, that everything you're working on is valid. Um, so the next thing I care about is actually the position that the cursor is at. This is called the caret. So we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna get it through the caret part of the data keys. The third thing I care about is the element that is at the caret. So the caret has this field offset, which is the position that the caret is at in the file. And then PSI files have this function on them, find element at, very handy, which returns the PSI element at an integer. So we get it the offset and it's gonna return the PSI element that's at that position. So, we have the PSI element, but remember, this could be like the semicolon, if they were just looking at the semicolon. What we actually care about is like a more top level part, and this is where the Java PSI interfaces start to come in. So here I'm saying it is PSI field. So what this function is doing is I'm using that PSI tree util to sort of do that runtime traversal of the PSI tree, and I'm saying of the element that I just got, find the first parent where it's a PSI field. So it will do that. If there is no PSI field, then it will return null. So I'm trying to cast it as a PSI field, that's what the as question mark is doing there, but if it isn't a PSI field or there wasn't a PSI field, that's just gonna return null. So again, we just return after that. It means if we get to the next line, that the position their cursor was at was indeed a PSI field, and that's what that value is gonna be, PSI field. So the next thing we wanna check on that PSI field is if it has the inject annotation on the PSI field, because we don't wanna be following or performing our action on just like regular fields for the class. So you do this by looking at the modifier list, which is a Java specific API, it's only on PSI field. Um, and you can look at the modifier list and find any annotations by just passing the fully qualified name of the annotation to it. So in this case, we're just checking to see if it has the inject annotation. And if it does, then we wanna perform the action. So this is what I was saying, like the first line, we're just saying we don't wanna perform the action, but if you get all the way to the end, then you do. So at this, at this point, we've determined that it is a field, it has the inject annotation there, so we can run our action, which is gonna bring us to the provider. So that's update. The next part is gonna be actually implementing action performed. And typically what you're doing is in, a, in an action, in the action performed part, the first few lines are gonna look exactly the same as what you're doing in update. The only difference is now you're gonna be using get required data because you've already checked to make sure that this data exists. So you're just calling get required data instead of get data because these are guaranteed non-null. The last thing I'm doing, before I was checking to see if it had the inject annotation there, instead what I'm doing is I just want the type of the PSI field. So depending on there what we're clicking on, in my example it was just some class is what I had called it. So in this case, injected type is just gonna be some class. And that's what we wanna check for in our providers to see if we can find something that's providing some class. So now that we've done that, we just need to get an instance of the project. 
which we can do again using get data, give us the project. And the reason we want this is because we're going to be using some managers that are going to require having a project. So we store it in a field right away. Um, and what we're going to do is use that file index to iterate over every single file in the project. Um, this isn't like very efficient. I wouldn't recommend doing this on every action. If you were writing a plugin yourself, you'd probably want to like cache the existing providers somewhere and then just iterate over those instead of iterating over every file. But for simplicity's sake, in this, in this situation, I'm just going to iterate over all of the files in the project. So I'm going to do that, iterate over all the files in the project, and you'll see it's giving me a virtual file. So what I'm going to be operating on is every individual virtual file in the project. The first thing that I want to do is see if it is a Java file. So I don't want to be operating on XML files or text files or anything like that. I only care about if it's a virtual file. So I'm going to use the, uh, the method I mentioned earlier to go from a virtual file to a PSI field, but also verify that it's a PSI Java file. And if it's not, I'm just going to get out of this function. And iterate content, uh, where you return a Boolean to it, and you return false if you're done iterating, you return true if you wanted to continue iterating. So in this case, this wasn't a Java file, so I wanted to continue iterating, which is why I return true to iterate content. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that that Java file has a class in it, um, because you can have a Java file that's just a bunch of static members. Um, so I verify that there is a child of type PSI class. If there is not, again, using the Elvis operator, I'm going to return true to say I want to continue, continue iterating over virtual files. And then what I want to do is make sure that that Java file is a module. Um, so something interesting is what you want to do when you're iterating over a lot of files like this is exit as early as possible. Because you're doing it on so many files, you want to like exit as soon as you know it's a file that doesn't fit your requirements, which is why I'm checking the most top level thing at each step. So like first I check if it's a Java file, then I check to make sure it has a class in it, then I check to make sure it's a module. Um, because at this point, I will have narrowed down the files I'm looking at to just the uh, dagger modules, which is going to be a small subset of all the files that I'm iterating over. And then what I want to do is find the actual provider method. Uh, and you can do this by looking at your PSI class, which is part of the Java PSI interfaces. It has a method, or it has a um, field on it called methods, which is just all of the methods that are part of that class. And then you can call find on it, which is a call-in function. It just iterates over a list and returns the first result that fits some predicate. So in my case, I just want to find the first element where its return type is the injected type. And then if I cannot find that, then I again want to return iterate content true, uh, just so that it will continue looking over all of the other modules. And then, once I've done this, that means I have actually found the method that provides the class I was looking for. So what I can do is navigate to that method. Uh, there's a separate implementation, implementation I'll show after this for navigate. Uh, and then I want to say, OK, I found, I found the element I was looking at, so I can return false to iterate content. I don't want to continue looking at virtual files. Uh, so when I was implementing this example, uh, when I was showing you the documentation example, examples of how you would find documentation. The first point I had listed was to just do command O where you're looking for a class, and then do the thing you care about, and then see if any results show up, and then look at the source code for that. So that is exactly what I did for this. I was implementing an action, so all I did was type go to action to see if there were any other actions that did go to as part of IntelliJ. There was a file called go to type declaration action, and I was like, okay, that's probably similar to what I'm doing. So I went there, and sure enough, there was a static method called navigate, which takes a PSI element and just navigates the cursor to that. So all I did for navigate was copy that exact source code to my own class, my go to provider action. Uh, and it's pretty simple, it's just using our existing IntelliJ APIs to do this. But oftentimes that's what you're doing, you're just like copy and pasting similar code into your own plugin that's going to do a similar action. Uh, so that's it, that's like a full functioning plugin. And actually, I wrote it up, I compiled it, and I ran it, and it worked. You can do go to provider on the element, and then it takes you to the method where it's actually being provided. 
And like that's that's honestly as how simple it is to create an IntelliJ plugin. Now this isn't a full feature plugin because I would still need to check and make sure that there's a provides annotation on the method. Uh, there's also situations where you can have a module override another module. So Dagger starts to get more complicated and you would need to make your action more complicated to deal with that. But at its core, this is a fully featured plugin. Like you could publish this to the JetBrains store and it would be working fine. Um, there is when you want to like bootstrap a plugin, there is a Gradle plugin for writing IntelliJ plugins called the Gradle IntelliJ plugin, although it should technically be called the Gradle IntelliJ plugin plugin because it's a Gradle plugin for IntelliJ plugins. But by using that, it makes it like really easy to publish your plugin. It has a bunch of like configuration fields for it to do it automatically. So if you're interested in writing a plugin, I would highly recommend using that. It's just called Gradle IntelliJ plugin. It's also made by JetBrains, so you know it's going to be good. Uh, yeah, and that's it. That's that's how to write an IntelliJ plugin, or how to understand one. Thank you. And I uh, still have a little bit of time, so if anyone has any questions, happy to... Is uh, Kotlin the only language that supports plugins, or...? No, uh, so you have to use Java. Previously, up to IntelliJ 2016, you actually had to use Java 6 which is why I would recommend using Kotlin, because Kotlin compiles down to Java 1.6 code. Um, so, yeah, the other nice thing is that a lot of those APIs I was showing return nullable objects, like the get data, for example, and Kotlin just has a really excellent syntax for dealing with nullable types. Um, so that's why I would like, if you're writing a plugin, I would definitely recommend using Kotlin, but it's, it's not required. Okay, so you can do them in Java. Yeah. But uh, it seems like the community mostly develops these plugins in Kotlin. Yeah, that's right. And uh, Kotlin is a JetBrains developed language, and it actually, they wrote the language to be used for writing IntelliJ. So it's like they're very, very, once you start using it, you see how well the APIs match up to Kotlin syntax. Yeah. Cool. Oh, one more. I uh, came across this. Uh, In an organization, oh, for JetBrains? Yeah, what did you say to uh, JetBrains, they're, well, the first thing I would say is like JetBrains is almost entirely open source, which as like a community is like, it's a pretty safe thing to invest in because a lot of their contributions are coming from outside of JetBrains as well. Um, JetBrains also has like an office in Boston, or like a pretty highly international office, uh, as well as I think their main office is actually in the Czech Republic. But uh, so I, I would say like I wouldn't worry about that. They've also received like obviously because Android Studio is based as an IntelliJ fork, uh, Android Google themselves actually work really closely with JetBrains. Um, so I would say that that is probably the strongest thing as like a support for JetBrains is that if Google is willing to put so much faith in the company, um, then it's probably safe for you to do the same. Square, it, we have a IntelliJ plugin called SQL Delight, which provides language level features to SQL Lite. Uh, it's also been open source. Beyond that, uh, we have other tools that are, have been open source. Uh, Jake Warden, who works at Square, has open source like many tools like Butterknife, as well as some auto value, uh, auto value extensions. So we just like we we use a lot of open source technology at Square and sort of promote working on open source technology. And it just so happened that the solution that we saw for the SQLite problem was an IntelliJ plugin, and that's sort of what started me down this route. Yeah. Another question, is there like a limitation in the plugin API for the ultimate versus community edition, or? Uh, you can specify one if you want. There isn't at, when you're working with APIs, Okay. So. Uh, but you can make your plugin ultimate only if you want. Okay. Yeah. Or, but that's, there's no, uh, there's no uh, limitation when you write plugins. Or the community. That's right. Yeah. Uh, what, what does your plugin to make SQLite easier to use? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> SQL Delight is 
Uh, it is a language level plugin, so it's you're writing a file that is not a Java file. You are writing a SQL file, and you're in it. You're putting like your create table statements and your queries, and then they get the language level features like syntax highlighting, autocomplete, refactoring. Um, and then what it does is it generates the strings that you would then pass to the Android APIs for you. So, so you just need to write the simple statement? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And what are uh, you saying uh, the AOS source code has, has helped you understanding how to build things like this? Yeah, the uh, AOSP is like a fantastic project for this because they're, if you think about intelligent plugins in general, they're like the only ones who are really sort of pushing the boundary. For me personally, when I was uh, working on SQL Delight, it had a lot of similarities to how Android works with XML files because when you're writing an XML file, it's automatically generating the RID file that you can then reference when you're writing code. And I wanted to do something similar while you're writing these queries, I wanted to generate the strings that you would then reference. So I found it really helpful to look over how they parse XML, uh, turn it into a model, and then generate this RIDs file. Um, they also, so that, that implementation is, is tricky because you also need a build side of it. Like you also need the CLI version that's gonna run on just like from the command line. Um, and so I was looking for parallels between their IntelliJ plugin and their Gradle plugin, which does it from the Gradle side, and like how they share code between the two so that they're not duplicating code is really interesting and there's a lot to be learned there. Uh, the, the like Android Gradle plugin is another source of like infinite knowledge when it comes to this stuff because they just like, the, the kind of stuff that Android is doing using these APIs is like really impressive. They, they're just recently started doing like GPU monitoring as well inside of Android Studio, which is just like mind blowing. They're using all of the same APIs that you can use to make your own plugin, but the things that they're doing with it are just are really incredible. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a really good source for that kind of stuff. Um, I noticed like in the PSI field, you had like uh, some things like modifier lists, maybe more Java specific to other languages have features too in that PSI field? Or? Yeah, yep. Uh, if you, so once you depend on other languages like Go or Rust or something like that, uh, they will implement their own subclass of PSI element. So it might be like PSI Go field, and then it will have Go specific stuff. But that's up to them what APIs they provide. Um, there is an interesting, there's a, JetBrains is working on right now, it's going to actually be a replacement for PSI. It's, I think right now the working title is UAST, which is Universal AST, and the goal is to provide similar uh, APIs, but for all languages. So something like Kotlin and Java have very, very similar, like they would both have that modifier list. But if you were writing a plugin that you wanted to work with both Java and Kotlin, you would need to handle them separately because they don't share an interface or an API. So there is like a push to start doing these more generic APIs within PSI. Um, so hopefully that will happen soon. But yeah, it, it's up to the uh, language developer, which like, it is. Like, how would that be exposed? Like, say you're working, right? You're working to this interface. Is it, is it dynamic? Like, that, if that field is added and provided by the person who's creating the object, you'll be able to see it in Kotlin? Or? If so, it's uh, you're expected to implement every single method of the interface that you're uh, extending. So if you extend like PSI reference, then you need to implement resolve, which is gonna take you to the source root. Uh, so something like PSI field, PSI field is actually a Java specific PSI element. Uh, so a Go field wouldn't extend PSI field, it would extend PSI element. Okay. So it, it wouldn't share the, and that's the problem that they're hoping to solve with the universal one. So you have different objects uh, for each language. Exactly. Okay. Which does, it, yeah, it makes it more difficult, but hopefully it will be solved soon. Yeah. Cool. All right, thank you.